So the, um, I'll be talking about a comprehensive crisis response system that currently does not exist in the United States, but there are many um, very talented people trying to make it uh, happen and organizations. And the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention's Crisis Now Report and SAMHSA's National Guidelines for Behavioral Health Crisis Care Report present models of an integrated crisis care system, which aims to divert individuals in mental health crisis away from jails and emergency departments, reduce unnecessary psychiatric hospitalizations, and reduce law enforcement involvement in mental health crises. And this past year, we saw how law enforcement involvement uh, sometimes um, ends up in unfortunate um, outcomes for folks in mental health crises. I'll focus first on the, the Crisis Now model. Um, it places crisis call centers at the hub of an integrated crisis care system, which also involves universal access to mobile crisis teams and crisis stabilization facilities. And according to this model, crisis call centers would be responsible not only for answering calls and de-escalating crises and referring callers to additional service as needed, which is what they currently do, but crisis centers would also be responsible for tracking and coordinating individuals' use of these other services in a role that's been described as care traffic control. And um, the to focus specifically on 988, the Nat National Suicide Hotline Designation Act of 2020 designates 988 as the national number uh, for suicide prevention and mental health crisis response. And in this upcoming July, in July of 2022, 988 will be activated nationally as the three digit dialing code for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, which you reach by, you know, calling currently calling 1-800-273-8255. If you press one, when you call this number, you, you get connected to the Veterans Crisis Line. So this Designation Act has really propelled crisis centers, uh, specifically those within the Lifeline Network, into the epicenter of plans for an improved mental health and suicide crisis response system in the U.S., um, many of you are probably familiar with the Lifeline, but I just wanted to take this one slide, which was developed by John Draper, who's the um, um, executive director of the National Suicide Prevention uh, Lifeline, that it is a network of independently operated, independently funded local and state call centers. It's not one large national call center, and there's some misunderstanding about that, I think. In the, um, in the public's uh, mind. Um, it's a national portal for connecting to localized services. It currently is made up of 100, over 190 crisis centers. And in 2020, it received 2.4 million calls. At the um, time of the 2001, national strategy for suicide prevention, uh, crisis centers and uh, crisis lines and hotlines were noticeably absent. Um, they were first highlighted in 2012 in the, in the national strategy, and they've continued their prominent position um, in the 2021 um, national strategy as well. So the question is, well, why wasn't it even mentioned in the national strategy in 2001. And um, the evidence base for crisis lines effectiveness at that time was considered insufficient to include, and to include them in the strategy. And the major milestone that occurred in 2001 in the advance, in the, um, advance of crisis lines was the funding of a national network of local certified call centers by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So the rest of my, much of the rest of my talk will focus on the empirical evidence on the effectiveness of crisis lines in the US, 
that emerged after the 2001 national strategy. Okay, oops, let's see why this is not moving. Um, okay, good. Um, the evaluation of the national network of crisis lines has been ongoing since the inception of the network in 2001. And the results from the evaluations have been used by SAMHSA and the Lifeline to shape best practice standards across the network. And then these new practices in turn led to additional evaluation studies. And this iterative process is fairly unique um, to this area and considered to be a gold standard in data-driven um, decision-making. So I'm not going to go into any details about the individual studies, it's just not enough time for that. Um, but I will present the major findings from the series of evaluation studies that we and others have done. And that prior to the lifeline evaluations, there was, pervasive, there was a pervasive impression that callers to crisis hotlines were not seriously suicidal individuals. And the evaluations dispelled what was essentially a myth by demonstrating that seriously suicidal individuals reach out to telephone crisis services. And our research found that 8% of callers were actually in the midst of a suicide attempt. 58% had made a prior suicide attempt. So these were seriously suicidal individuals. A major finding was the demonstration that caller suicide risk was significantly reduced from the beginning to the end of the call. And another major finding was that counselors at Lifeline centers were more likely to inquire about current suicidal ideation, recent ideation and past attempts, and callers were more likely to experience reduced distress than um, call, you know, callers who were calling centers that were not part of the Lifeline network. And that, um, as we know, everyone who's been, um, talking today and probably all the members of the audience know that it's absolutely critical to ask about current suicidal ideation and you know the, the so on. Um, and that individuals at risk will not necessarily volunteer their suicidal thoughts without explicitly being asked about them. So after engaging for a clinician, a patient, or in this case, a caller, and building their trust because the building of the trust is one of the most important things that the, the crisis counselors do, as well as clinicians do, that once that trust is built, the patient or the caller, um, then I'll be talking about chatters and texters as well, um, should be asked if they're thinking, of, explicitly asked if they're thinking about killing themselves. Not necessarily thinking of hurting themselves, but thinking of killing themselves. And asking about, um, you know, ask about current thoughts and past thoughts and behavior. And from our research, which has now been replicated by many other studies, we know that asking individuals about suicide will not put suicidal ideas in their heads. Rather, not asking about suicide is distressing if someone is suicidal. So you need to give the suicidal individual the opportunity to share their feelings. And this is across the age span. Um, determining whether a caller is at imminent risk of engaging in suicidal behavior and in need of emergency intervention is one of the most significant judgments that a lifeline crisis center counselor has to make. And clearly, this is a judgment that frontline clinicians and first responders and all clinicians need to make as well. The lifeline's imminent risk policy provides a formulation of imminent risk that's based on the core concepts of the interpersonal psychological theory of suicide, IPTS, that was developed by Thomas Joyner. And the Lifeline's modified IPTS model asserts that the combination of suicidal desire, which um, for the most part is suicidal ideation, with intent and acquired capability is associated with imminent risk. And with regard to intent, um, you know, whether someone has a plan, engaged in preparatory behaviors, expressed an intent to die. Uh, capability is demonstrated by a history of, of attempts, having an available means of uh, being dysregulated, currently intoxicated, 
And um, um, what's also included is an assessment of buffers to see if someone has immediate supports and reasons for living and so on. And that um, the lifelines imminent risk um, model and policy um, asserts that suicidal ideation or desire is relatively common and it doesn't signal imminent risk of suicide if either intent or capability is absent. And they have, um, you know, they being the lifeline has very detailed definitions, but we can, if there are questions, we can go into it. Um, but that the inclusion of suicidal desire and intent and capability and buffers in the lifeline risk assessment model is not designed to replace the counselor's judgment, but it assists them in assessing the short-term um, risk. The factors that we've seen crisis counselors consider when making um, the judgment about imminent risk about a caller is whether the or not the caller believes they can keep themselves safe after the call, whether or not the caller is intoxicated, and whether or not the caller can engage, whether the counselor can engage the caller in collaborative problem solving. And um, crisis counselors do, you know, have been trained in uh, Barbara Stanley's and Greg Brown's um, safety planning intervention, and they use safety planning um, quite extensively. Now, with regard to the finding on this slide and the next slide, the purpose of our evaluation was not to assess the contribution of these um, facets of risk, you know, desire, intent, and capability to an individual's imminent imminent risk status. I just wanted to give you some idea of the components of the risk assessment that crisis counselors did. Rather, the main goals of the evaluation um, was to describe the types of interventions that are implemented with lifeline callers whom counselors consider to be at imminent risk. And what we found was that crisis counselors are able to secure the caller's collaboration on an intervention on over 75% of imminent risk calls. So even though person's at imminent risk, they, they the crisis counselors can engage the callers to collaborate in their, um, in their safety. And on about 19% of imminent risk calls, the counselors did have to send emergency services, such as the police or EMS, with the collaboration though of the callers. And then on another quarter, an additional quarter of the imminent risk calls, the counselors sent emergency services without the callers collaboration. So overall about 43% of imminent risk calls did involve emergency services, but that's leaving the majority of these imminent risk calls um, not involving emergency services or emergency interventions. So what we saw was that the collaborative interventions that didn't involve emergency services included getting rid of means, involving what's called a third party, that's you know, someone else in their uh, family or a friend who um, can um, help them, collaborating on a safety plan and agreeing to receive a follow-up from the crisis center. We've done other evaluations of third party callers who are calling the lifeline on behalf of someone that they're worried about. And that it turns out that the crisis counselors <laughs> agreed that they should be worried and that they deemed the person that uh, the third party was calling about to be at imminent risk. And we found that these third party callers are also able to be provided with a range of interventions which can supplement and at times replace calling 911. Um, we've also done evaluations of follow-up interventions that crisis counselors are engaged in and that we found that crisis calls, uh, follow-up calls um, reduce suicidal individuals' perceived risk of future suicidal behavior. Now to increase access to crisis services, Lifeline service uh, format has evolved to include not only telephone, but also um, uh, crisis chat interventions, um, and now they're starting um, text. And I think many of you may also be aware of the um, crisis text line, which is not part of the, the lifeline. And I'm 
involved in some evaluation of the effectiveness of the crisis text line as well, but I'm going to just be talking about the Lifeline Crisis Chat Network. And so the uh, Lifeline Crisis Chat Network serves all ages. It's grown extensively since its formal establishment in 2013, um, but it answers far fewer chats than the Lifeline Telephone Service um, answers telephone calls, because I mentioned the two point, you know, over 2 million calls answered in 2020, whereas, you know, over 200,000 chats were answered in 2020. And in an evaluation that we uh, recently published, what we found was that about 84% of chatters to the Lifeline Crisis Chat Network endorsed either current or recent suicidal ideation on a pre-chat survey which is markedly higher than the estimated 23% of callers who are suicidal on the day, um, either the day of or the day before their calls, so that they are, it's a, a much more seriously suicidal group of folks who are using chat um, than who are calling. With regard to the outcomes from our effectiveness study, uh, we found that two thirds of chatters reported that the chat was helpful and that they were, we had measures of distress before the chat and after the chat and the chatters were significantly and substantially less distressed at the end of the chat um, intervention than they were at the beginning. And about half reported being less suicidal at the, at the, end, of the, at the end of the chat. The summary of the, you know, with regard to the lifeline evaluations, and as I've said, individuals at risk of suicide do utilize suicide hotlines. Um, callers experience reductions in their crisis and suicidal states over the course of the crisis call. Crisis counselors can collaborate with callers to de-escalate imminent risk, um, suicide risk without the use of 911 or an emergency department. Um, although, as I said, they do use um, you know, emergency services also. Callers may experience continued or recurring suicidal thoughts in the weeks following their crisis call, which is not surprising. These are people at very high risk and you know, one call to a crisis center is not going to um, alleviate all their problems and you know, cure them. Um, so that there is a need for follow-up and continuity of care and follow-up calls are important suicide prevention tools that are routinely used by crisis counselors on, in the Lifeline network, and that clinicians as well, um, you know, should consider follow-up calls to be best practice. And they, you know, clinicians should consider conducting follow-up calls with suicidal patients. Although I think, as you know, the folks have mentioned earlier on, you know, the reality of time constraints and so on, you know, might make that difficult. Um, you know, a difficult practice, but it's something that would be an effective practice. And that crisis chat services are utilized actually by, uh, and one of the reasons why they were developed is that they are utilized by a younger and high risk population. And they're important adjuncts to telephone hotlines. And um, lifeline centers have been shown to be more effective than centers outside of the, outside of the network. As I mentioned with the 988 designation, the calling 988 wouldn't just reach any crisis hotline. It would be reaching crisis hotlines in the network. Um, there's, you know, remaining key challenges um, to the implementation of 988, um, in addition to capacity issues and funding issues. Um, but there's still room for improvement in communication between Lifeline crisis centers and 911 and EDs and other crisis and emergency services. Mobile crisis teams and stabilization facilities, which are absolutely critical to the continuity and you know comprehensiveness and of the of a crisis care system, are currently not universally available as resources for lifeline crisis centers. So that's going to have to be established um, and soon. And chatters and texters are more likely to be suicidal than callers, as I've emphasized. And uh, lifeline services will be needed, you know, will need to increase capacity to meet their needs. And, uh, you know, I'll be happy to share the presentation and um, at the very last slide lists a number of citations as well as a, um, uh, 
this report that we prepared for the um, National Association of Mental Health Program, uh, a National Association of State Mental Health um, Program Directors that summarizes much of this work in 988 and role of um, crisis centers during COVID as well. And so I will now um, stop sharing my screen. And um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity that I, you know, hoping that the clinicians who are, you know, viewing all these wonderful presentations will realize that 988 will be a valuable resource to their patients, you know, so that patients can be calling 988, um, you know, in the middle of the night, on, you know, Sunday at 6 a.m. <laughs> and so on. It's an important resource for clinicians to know about and to recognize that it didn't just get, you know, it's not being established um, without a real foundation of empirical knowledge about the effectiveness of the service. Okay, thanks.